you know, these are all just concepts. And they don't really have a referent, do they? Well, happiness, you know, we all think that we know what happiness is, but, you know, there's been, there have been a lot of books recently written on this subject, and, and there is a lot of debate as to what exactly happiness is. Can anybody tell me what it is? Fame and fortune. <laughs> That's what I see all over the place. Yeah, but are people who have a lot of fame and fortune, are they happy? Uh, they think they are. I think a Richard Corey would you say that. Who was that? <laughs> that was a song by Simon and Garfunkel. Richard Corey was a rich guy, and they wanted to be like Richard Corey guy in the song, uh, and he says, and at the end he says, and Richard Corey went home and put a bullet through his head. Well, just different forms of happiness. <laughs> but anyway, the point was, is the people, the guy singing the song thinks of Richard Corey as being happy and wonderful, and he's got all this money and power, and he's great, but in the end he goes home and puts a bullet through his brain. Right, right. Well, you know, there are lots of articles in the newspapers these days about lottery winners, yeah. And uh, the fact that they, they're not so happy after they've won the, the lottery. The, the burden and the responsibility of all that money, f for some reason, really uh, creates more problems than, than they ever thought they would have. I think that, um, that everybody wants that high, which they consider happiness, but then of course it, it never stays, so mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. a constant striving to be Oh, well, that's what she's talking about. That's what she's talking about right here. Yes. And once you have achieved the state of happiness, you must never become lax about maintaining mm -hmm. it. Now, I don't know exactly how you go about maintaining it. Yeah. You know, it's funny you should mention lottery winners because the security guard at the school I worked for in Massachusetts won $4 million. Yeah. The only thing that changed is he got a new uniform, a new gun, and a new Camry. That was it. He continued to come and work every day, doing his job. Hmm. He was happy. And he seemed yeah. to be perfectly satisfied. Had purpose. I would say it shows sort of a definite lack of imagination, but that's what <laughs> <laughs> Well, hey, I don't know what he did in his free time. How many definitions of happiness do you want? Okay, well, that's one quote. Here's a quote, I love this quote. This is a quote that appeared in an article in Tricycle Magazine. Actually, it's not an article, it's an interview. It appeared in Tricycle Magazine way back in 1995, and the, the interview is with uh, a gentleman um, by the name of Taitetsu Uno. Tetsu Uno, who is a priest in uh, the Pure Land tradition. And so they were asking him uh, about his uh, experience as a, in that tradition. And uh, at one point in this, in this interview, he, he tells a, a story that he heard one time. And he said, the very distinguished abbot of a huge Zen monastery wrote this little article that said, quote, In Zen, there are only three things. First, cleaning. Second, chanting. And third, devotion. That's all. Unquote. Many Americans go to Zen hoping to get enlightened, but they don't want to do the cleaning. <laughs> cleaning or cleaning? cleaning? Cleaning. Oh, shit, yeah. <laughs> it's very demanding and rigorous. Of course, I, I agree with that, but I would say many Americans go to Zen hoping to get enlightened, but they don't want to do the cleaning or the chanting or the devotion. <laughs> they don't want to do any of it. Instant gratification. I think that's wonderful. You know, that, that, you know, we're not talking about, uh, you know, dependent co-arising. 
and we're not talking about impermanence, and we're not, we're not talking about shunyata or emptiness. We're talking about cleaning and chanting and devotion. Was it you who told me the other day what reality is? Well, we'll get to that tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think that's wonderful. I think that's, you know, that's a perfect expression of this practice. You know, we've, we've talked a lot about chanting recently and, and the importance of sangha and everything. Uh, devotion, I think that really is uh, directed at, at the first of the three treasures, which is the Buddha. And, you know, cleaning. Chanting could have to do with, with the Dharma, and cleaning is very much a part of the Sangha. And I think it's wonderful. Okay. Um, I have another quote that sort of goes along with that one. It's a very famous quote. And, and I'm sure you've probably heard it at one time or another in, in your life. And that is the, uh, the little prayer that St. Augustine was supposedly, uh, supposedly read. Um, well, anyway, what he said was, Dear Lord, please make me chaste, but not yet. <laughs> I really like that quote. If you could forever strive for happiness. <laughs> I mean, I could. That's, that's been sort of the story of my life. I don't know about you guys, but it's been the story of my life, you know. Yeah, I want to get there. I want all that good stuff. I want to become enlightened. I want to become an unpassionate, a compassionate bodhisattva and all that good stuff, but not yet. Right? Of course, I'm sort of running out of time here. <laughs> not funny. But not yet. Not <laughs> Okay, here's another quote. This was given by a, uh, a mathematician at MIT. His name was Pac, Pac, or Pac Tor, David Pac Tor. Um, he said, uh, reality is that stuff which, no matter what you believe, just won't go away. <laughs> I think that's very interesting. <coughs> I love that that reservation that he gives here. No matter what you believe, yeah. and he's pointing directly at the fact that the belief has a lot to do with what we consider reality to to be. You know. Um, I'm a big I'm a big fan of, of modern philosophy. I like to read. You know, people like Zizek and, and Derrida and, and a bunch of strange characters from Europe that have a lot to say about, you know, subjects and objects and points of view and, and stuff like that. And the question, the question of reality or of ontology is always at the center of everything that of every one of their discussions in some form or another. But uh, the thing that I find so attractive about this particular quote is that it's written in, it's, it's not using any technical terms. Reality is that stuff which, no matter what you believe, just won't go away. What a great definition. He's a, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. That's all I've got. That's all I've got.
This, um, this interview with uh, Taitetsu Uno is really quite interesting. Um, he talks a lot about surrender in this, in this uh, interview. Uh, because apparently surrender is an important uh, part of that tradition that he practices. You know, I don't know if any of you know what the Pure Land tradition is. Do you know? Does, does anybody know what the Pure Land tradition is about? It's the Christian form of Buddhism. No, no. Sure. Yeah. It's close. No, there, there have been a lot of, uh, a lot of um, people here in this country who who practice within this tradition. And um, instead of doing a lot of meditating, they do a lot of chanting. Um, and they sort of uh, take what we have been talking about recently uh, to a much more serious level. <clears throat> and um, as part of their uh, teaching has a lot to do with surrender. Um, but the interviewer asked the question, this is the first question that he asked, as a matter of fact. Can you talk a little bit about how you understand surrender in Buddhist practice? Now, we've talked about surrender here in this tradition um, because that is a very important part of Jukai, isn't it? Because... Um, one of the things that we emphasize in the classes that we teach around Jukai is that you're, you are, in effect, surrendering, your, surrendering yourself to a teacher and to the Dharma, and as, as well as to the Sangha. Um, and so I think that this is the question that's being asked in this interview. And his answer is, in the first place, surrender is a Western religious category. Now that is very true. I mean, anybody, any, any, anyone, uh, any member of the Allied Army in the South Pacific understands that the Japanese had no concept of surrender. Mm -hmm. And he goes on to say, in Buddhism, surrender is at the core of giving up the ego self but we don't use a special term for it because the whole thrust of Buddhist life revolves around surrender, giving up the ego. Now that's very, that's very interesting because this is very much what I was talking about um, in a previous talk about the importance of context. You know, and I used the example of, uh, of a person 500 years ago in Europe being asked whether they believed in God or not. No. It doesn't apply. Belief implies that you have a choice, either to believe or not to believe. Uh, 500 years ago in Europe, uh, God was everywhere. His works were manifested everywhere. There was no discussion about whether you believed in God or not. Uh, they would be appalled at the fact that we are currently having this ongoing argument over the existence of God in, in, the, in the media. Because it, it was simply a question that wasn't raised. And he's making the same statement about surrender. And how, you know, giving up the ego self is basically a process of surrendering. And since it lies at the very center of this practice, it's not a question of whether we believe or whether we you know, have a choice in, in making that surrender or not. It's something that is at the core of our entire tradition. So the interviewer goes on to ask, but how can we learn to surrender the ego self voluntarily? That's, that's an interesting question, because that, the, the first thing that jumps into my mind is this quote by Elizabeth Gilbert, 
where she is making a definite choice to be happy. You know, so is it possible to make a choice with regard to surrendering voluntarily, as it says here? And he answers, in the Shen Buddhist tradition, as we listen to the teaching, we are made to realize that we can never surrender ourselves. Duh. Resistance comes from the deepest center of our karmic selves. Hmm. Get that, Gerhard? <laughs> Gerhard. And I just had a discussion about, you know, surrendering yourself or, you know, giving up the self, giving up the ego self. That's why the Buddha Amida's compassion says, you don't have to surrender. When I hear that, when I understand that I can't do it because it's not my nature, that, that it's like saying, fly to the sky, then I realize that I don't have to surrender. Yet naturally and spontaneously, the surrender takes place by virtue of true compassion. That's it. You see? And that's what's missing in this quote by, by Gilbert. You have to put yourself in a position where you can do it without having to voluntarily do it. And that's what this practice is about. You mean how it could become part of you? Yes. That's right. You know, that's, um, it's like when I was uh, learning to meditate. When I was first learning how to sit and how to meditate and how to do the practice, my goal was to try to put myself, or to, to volunteer myself, uh, to give up or try to at least control my thinking, or to get beyond my thinking. You know? And that's not something that, you, that is easy to do. Um, you have to learn how to put yourself in a position where it, comes, it becomes natural. You know, which is one of the reasons why I don't give a lot of instruction about meditation. And what you should do is just sit there. And I don't care what you do as long as you are quiet and don't disturb anybody else. Because eventually you're going to run out of stuff to think about. You know, and you're going to get bored. You're going to have, you know, you're going to have planned all the vacations that you ever wanted to take. You have designed your dream house. You have, you know, spent all this time daydreaming about whatever it is you, you're concerned about. And finally, you have nothing left to think about. And mindfulness sort of comes naturally. You know? And you begin, and one of, the, one of the most basic and important realizations that you first have in this practice is the fact that your thoughts are entirely transitory. And you have the choice as to whether you're going to act on them or not. You see? Now for a lot of people, including myself, that was a big revelation. That's an important realization. And that's what you have to put yourself, that's what you have to acquire and it ha you have to sort of sneak up on it. And the way you do that is to put yourself in a cross-legged position on a zafu, on a zabaton, and sit there for long periods of time. And you know, as far as the process of getting beyond thinking, You know, at some point you always have to get up off the cushion and you have to go back to this, this world. And that inevitably means that you have to uh, give up 
the beyond thinking. But if you have sat long enough and have enough experience in the practice, the beyond thinking goes with you naturally. You know, compassion is the manifestation of the unity of the absolute and the relative. And when you sit on your cushion, you become the unity of the absolute and the relative. You become the awake mind. And that is a compassionate mind. And it also is a mind that allows itself to raise, or it allows wisdom to bloom. You know, the compassion does not exist in the world of the absolute. Compassion exists in the world of thinking, in the world of the relative. But it only becomes into full flower when it is joined with wisdom, which is something that we find in the absolute. The whole of this practice you know, can be summarized by saying that it is a process of learning how not to follow your thoughts. And on a daily basis, I mean, I come up here and sit every morning for an hour. Sometimes I'm more successful than others. But every time I make that kind of a judgment, I'm back in the world of the relative. Because <laughs> whether my, my Zazen is effective or not is purely a conceptual, a conceptual judgment. cannot become Buddha nature. Original Buddhahood is Buddha's mischievous talk. The original mind of sentient beings is nothing but delusion. <laughs> and here's a story that came out of a, a collection of, of Joshu's sayings. A monk asked Joshu, what is the great perfection of wisdom? Joshu replied, the great perfection of wisdom. Another monk asked him, what is meditation? Joshu replied, non-meditation. The monk asked again, how can meditation be non-meditation? Joshu said, it's alive. Another monk asked, what is one word? Joshu said, two words. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>